Thank you very much, actually. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The hour is late, so the last paper should be all singing, all dancing. Now, these disciplines are not my forte, so I hope the graffiti will suffice in their own merit. Uh, now, I hope you don't share the, the opinion of Sir Alan Gardiner, namely that these texts are somewhat stereotypical and, uh, well, he didn't exactly use the word, but also somewhat boring. Well, they may be stereotypical, but I hope they're not boring. Um, with visitors' graffiti, what is also interesting is that uh, they come in, uh, well, in stereotypical forms, but yet different sizes and shapes. Hence, it, it was opportune to make a choice for one corpus, namely for the Memphite graffiti corpus for today. Now, you may uh, consider uh, it a bit superfluous to talk about landscape and spaces, because obviously the graffiti occupy a space, they name a space, the space is probably sacred, it's a temple, and they are certainly located in the landscape. So what is the fuss about? Uh, well, as follows. With the Memphite corpus, and I hope to give you a brief outline in a moment. This is mainly graffiti in royal uh, pyramid complexes, although not exclusively, and they are quite interesting, quite unique from the point of view of what they contain, actually the formulae, the text contents, but also the uh, context. They are very diverse from other graffiti, but they still can be fruitfully, I hope, compared to the corpora of graffiti, for instance, in Thebes or in recent uh, discoveries in Asyud and elsewhere. There is Beni Hassan, there is El Bersha, uh, and there are actually several other uh, places. So now the um, corpus outline. Uh, well, it's not much better than the white maps, but I, I hope you can see that. Uh, now, um, this, uh, as any outline, this is actually deceptive. As one notable contemporary historian said, uh, well, it's preferable to have an accurate mess to an elegant untruth. Now, this outline is actually elegant untruth, because behind it are over 350 texts coming from various parts of the Memphite necropolis, plus the extension of Medum. Now, why Medum in the Fayum Oasis? Well, it shares with the Memphite graffiti several characteristics. It's an old kingdom complex with uh, mainly, though again not exclusively, new kingdom graffiti, coming mainly, though not exclusively, from 18th dynasty. And they are also coming from the same uh, sort of main graffiti-making reigns of 18th dynasty as those in Saqqara and Dashur, namely that Moses III and Amenophis III will come to that as well. So that's why there is Medum with Memphis. Uh, now, the, the other points are actually, that's where the deception comes. Everything else that's simplified in this table is, um, well, a bit different in reality. There are graffiti placed on old and middle kingdom royal pyramid complexes. Uh, that is, the graffiti makers came several centuries or almost a millennium after the visited place uh, had been built. However, in Saqqara, there are also graffiti put on recent tombs from the point of view of graffiti makers. Haremhap may be a sufficient example. Uh, then further on, 18th dynasty and 19th dynasty in graffiti making is not the same. And in addition, there is no universal rule to, to say, let's, let's um, uh, compare, for instance, Saqqara and Dashur. Uh, 18th dynasty graffiti in Saqqara will follow the usual uh, visitor's graffiti pattern, the coming of a scribe to see. Uh, whereas the 19th dynasty graffiti at the same place, that is Saqqara, will follow a slightly different pattern, starting with a formula Eri, Nefer, Osiris, um, and so on. Now, if you would expect this to be repeated in other places, you're right. There are places where this division between 18th and 19th dynasty works, but it doesn't work everywhere, and that's we're still moving in Memphis, not making trips to Thebes, where the situation is uh, specific in its own terms. Uh, what happens, for instance, in Dashur, we get 18th dynasty visitors graffiti, Iutpu, and so on. People came to see the monument. Now, 19th dynasty graffiti, well, pursue a very different course because they are actually marks of stonemasons um, probably dismantling the complex. So again, um, a slightly, um, well, maybe more than slightly different setup. 
Uh, now, how to make the more or less accurate mess out of the elegant untruth? Uh, well, we can follow the text studies that involve various descriptive as well as analytical steps, and we will use some of that in our uh, ensuing investigation of what the graffiti can tell us about spaces and landscapes. Moreover, we might also like the contextual studies, uh, and I'd like you to remember the fact that there is something to be said about spatial relations within and without graffiti, and also the graffiti themselves are markers of ancient relation to the visited space. Now finally, to get to that, what we have with graffiti and spatial relations is the following. A bit of a standalone question is the spatial relations within the graffiti texts, to which I'm coming in a moment, and that's a separate thing that deals with the description of the visited space. And then, of course, what follows is the graffiti themselves in a space, so it's spatial relations without the texts, but still the texts are in a given space. And then also, it's the wall, it's the room, it's the temple, and on a macro scale, it's also the landscape. Now, coming to the first bit of a standalone thing, which is a concern with the text analysis, what you see here is a dissected part of a typical visitor's graffito. It's not the majority of visitors' graffiti that looks like that, because many of them are much shorter. It's just a name, or it's just the first sentence, the coming of the scribe, so and so. I'm saying scribe because it's a conventional translation, but that comes with a huge baggage of meaning of its own which we may manage to uh, touch upon uh, later on. Now, what is interesting is that these people are coming to see. Now, following Helen, yes, seeing seems to be quite important in graffiti as well, because they are coming not just to merely observe, but this ma'a within uh, New Kingdom texts uh, gets more connotations. Uh, following Kai Wittmeyer and, and his observation on Egyptian landscape, to see means also to control, for instance, agricultural works, or to inspect. The aspect of inspecting was also mentioned uh, several times in context of biographical texts of 18th dynasty. Uh, people like Ineni, for instance, would go and ma'a, or ma with one alif, uh, a royal work. So they will, again, they would come to see in terms of inspecting. Uh, so what these people were coming to do in visitors' graffiti, they were coming possibly also to make some kind of a check on the, on the building, not merely to observe its uh, aesthetic values. Even though it looks like that, because we follow with the fact that they found it nefer, conventionally beautiful, but in theory you might also suggest nefer might mean complete. So they actually checked on the building and found it in uh, some acceptable or decent state. Uh, they compared it, some of them did, especially in Dashur, uh, to all other temples. We may uh, suggest a hypothesis, maybe all other temples of Memphis, all other temples of Egypt. That's something purely conjectural. And then comes the spatial relationship, which actually I'm indebted to Todd Gillen, now of Liège, who pointed out that Mgenu is not necessarily on only the preposition inside, in this case, inside the temple, but it could be in the interior of. Now, what happens if it's inside the temple? Well, there is heaven inside the temple, and there is also sun rising in it in Imes, presumably in the temple. Now, when you take Mhenu for in, in the interior of the temple, then you have the interior of the temple sort of filled in with heaven, and the sun is rising Imes, pet, that would still be in the heaven, not necessarily in the temple. So what happens with the inside of the, the inner space of a royal funerary complex in turns into heaven in the moment of sunrise, in the moment just after dawn, depending how you would like to translate the, the verbal form. So that's the sort of recreation of highly symbolic and very powerful space within the visited uh, temple. So, so that's a question of... Uh, um, recreating spaces by the visitors via the graffiti uh, texts. However, what we're also concerned with is the space 
where the graffiti actually sit on the walls, the micro spaces, the areas and buildings. And here I would rather go into practical examples, starting in Abusir with a, a Borchardt's reconstruction. Well, it's not so much of a reconstruction, but actually capturing of his finds uh, in the uh, pyramid complex of Sahura. Pity is that actually we don't have context for that. We do have several graffiti that survived in, in Ellen Gardiner's papers. Uh, we know that Georg Müller investigated many more and included some uh, signs in his paleography. And we know that the graffiti in Sahara's complex were in context, as it often happens with visitors' graffiti, of other New Kingdom finds. In this case, the cult of Sahmet of Sahara. Uh, the problem is we don't know where exactly they were, what relation they had to the wall, how high they might have been. Uh, were they just scribbled across the relief decoration? Were they steering clear of the relief decoration? That's something we cannot say for Sahura. We may suggest they were probably placed, for instance, on the uh, upper part of the dado, but that's because this is what happens in other places. In other places. Um, Moving to Saqqara in the complex of Djoser, we know a bit more. We can follow, actually, the visitors. They went through the entrance colonnade. The question mark is here because there are only little fragments, but interesting fragments, a uh, short footnote. This is, at present, the only place in, within the step pyramid complex where there is a hint of a literary text in a graffito. It's a beginning of an instruction text. It says this sort of, for the, literally, the beginning of a, of a spy it, and then it, it just breaks off, unfortunately. So that's, uh, that's a pity. So they probably could have at least ventured in the entrance colonnade in the 18th dynasty, and then they focused on the two chapels, the north and south. Um, what they left there is plenty of texts in different heights on the wall, which um, I think I had the opportunity to talk about uh, on a, at a previous, <coughs> sorry, at a previous conference. Um, what is interesting about these texts is that they are giving a very good example of a bulk of 18th dynasty and 19th dynasty material, and they show that these chapels, were, the spaces, are actually accessible, and the walls were standing because you have them high up over two meters on a wall as it has been reconstructed partially. But you also have them very low as if somebody was sitting on the floor and writing. Uh, the situation repeats itself in Senwasa III at Dashur. Now, why I'm showing you just a plan? Well, this complex was effectively, except for the pyramid, raised to the ground. At least some of this raising to the ground happened in the Ramesside times, if we are to believe the Ramesside markings on uh, the um, undecorated blocks, blocks that were probably ready to be removed. So most of the visitors' activity concentrates in 18th dynasty, most of the dated graffiti then uh, to the reign of Thutmosis III, actually. Uh, in case of St. Walther III, however, we have plenty of limestone chippings, suggesting of a major uh, removal activity and plenty of really fragments and thanks to Dieter Arnold and Adela Oppenheim and, and the uh, well all the metropolitan team actually it is possible to reconstruct not just the structure but the individual buildings the pyramid temple the south temple is speculative a bit um, and we know that there were dados, we know that there were high walls with reliefs, and that there were big door jams and thicknesses with painted decoration. And here again, the same pattern. Graffiti on dados, not or seldom across relief decoration, on flat surfaces, painted dados, painted door jams. Uh, and again, people coming to see and identifying a hood nature of Hakaura of San Mosre III. Uh, the Dashur situation actually allows us a bit of an insight into graffiti ergonomics, which uh, the hour is late, and so I used a bit of a cartoon-like presentation. This is Dieter Arnold's reconstruction of what could have been, might have been, the uh, courtyard of the South Temple, work in progress. Now, what happened with it in the New Kingdom? Well, it probably lost some of its colors. There probably might have been a debris, because you do have graffiti 
on fragments of columns that are relatively high up. The whole column has over four meters, so here we are in the middle, that's over two meters above the, what might have been the original ground. If we assume the presence of debris, then people could have got actually that far up, unless they had ladders, scaffolding, or other structures. So that's the cartoon uh, for you. So that's the microspace is physically described, but also there is the question of what did they think when they came in? That is the reappropriation or perhaps reinterpretation, repurposing, kind of uh, creating not just palimpsest in writing on decorated walls, as, as uh, Anne Garnett mentioned, but also a palimpsest in sort of understanding of that space. Well, there wasn't much of a, much of a change in some respects, and yet a change there was. Well, if you think about motivations behind graffiti making, conventionally, this is what you get, uh, including the classical quote from Borchardt. There is emphasis on piety, there is emphasis on what could be uh, period tourists or pilgrims. But there are other options, uh, which I hope this uh, table is uh, summarizing. People were actually coming uh, recognizing a sacred space, also recognizing the person of the king. Some of them were probably able to read hieroglyphs because at least in Dashur they were able to copy or react to the cartouches of Saint Wassel III Khakaura with three cars. Other people who came to Dashur were not caring about the hieroglyphic cartouches. They used the form that was common in hieratic texts. You could see it, let's say, in hieratic king lists one uh, one of those. Uh, where is Senmo said the third Hakaura with one ka sign and plural strokes. So some of them actually p might have reacted to the decoration in a very literal sort of way, whereas others kept their sort of mental baggage all right, I know this king from a king list and this is how you write his name. Which also actually means they m could have had a sort of knowledge whose pyramid complex it was before they actually hit the spot. And then they came to react to a recognized sacred space and sort of reappropriated it for their own non-royal participation in a uh, royal uh, funerary cult because they were entering a royal complex. Now this is a bit of a moot point because we can't say that New Kingdom people wouldn't have dared to do something like that in a New Kingdom royal funerary complex because there is a recent, recently published ostracon, not graffito, ostracon from Daryl Bahri in the last uh, Bill 10 of IFAO, I believe, saying exactly the graffiti formula, there came to see scribe so-and-so, but he came to see Jesser Jesseru, with the name of the complex of Hatshepsut. And it seems to be an 18th dynasty ostracon with a graffito text on it. Uh, well, we can only hope for more context and more details about this find to um, appear. Uh, coming from micro spaces, people actually coming inside a building that probably was standing, even though damaged and with some amount of debris, but still standing and worth this reaction, we're moving to the landscapes, to the macro spaces. Now, landscapes, as Mirek Barta mentioned straight away this morning, come in different sizes and different meanings. We have the geographical ones, but we also have the symbolic ones, the sort of landscapes of memory also. People are coming to see a landscape not as it is, even though it's standing in front of them, but as they, as they imagine it, as they see it to mean something for them. This uh, apparently seems to be one of those uh, things that appear to be more or less universal in uh, human history, at least as we know it at present. Uh, for the geographical space, I borrowed a, a shot of, of Darshur, again with Sen III, uh, and very generically, uh, what we have to remember when judging graffiti, there were always New Kingdom burials or New Kingdom tombs in the Saqqara environment, and also settlements. Uh, well, this I keep on purpose in a very generic, unspecific way, because there could be a big discussion about the location of New Kingdom Memphis and its suburbs. Uh, 
uh, which probably weren't that far. And that brings another uh, point in our uh, debate, namely uh, people who were working in New Kingdom uh, buildings in Saqqara, in Dashur um, and elsewhere in Abu Sir, they had to live somewhere. Were they coming from Memphis, as has been suggested for Old Kingdom buildings, or did they have specific cities or some kind of a Daryl Medina for the Memphite necropolis close by. This is an open question, uh, but the amount of graffiti on the Memphite necropolis is probably one of the reasons why we should um, consider this. So graffiti in their bigger geographical uh, setting and also graffiti in their cultural uh, setting, the symbolic landscape of memory. What happens in 18th dynasty? Interest in the past, that's not very original, many dynasties do the same, but what 18th dynasty does is very emphatic interest in the past, especially under certain reigns. And what happens throughout Egyptian history that art and architecture borrows or inherits, or there is sort of an, a reproductive tradition um, of motifs. Now, there is a correlation, there seems to be a correlation between buildings that borrow from previous buildings and those which have uh, graffiti. Uh, now, Adela Oppenheim actually uh, established a very likely link between the decoration of Dashur, San Mursad III, and the temple of Hatshepsut at Dar al-Bahri, the birth scene and related uh, elements. Now, um, and then you see the graffiti in San Wasa III, and some of them are certainly from the reign of St. Moses III, from, e even from the early parts of, of that reign, so where you have the, the overlap with uh, Hatshepsut. Then there are other uh, elements in other temples of Hatshepsut and St. Moses III that were probably taken from somewhere else. Uh, follow Yiri Yanak and his uh, Vogelauf explanation. Vogelauf is an, a scene that's inherited throughout Egyptian history, a king running with a bird towards a deity. Now that bird that the king, uh, for instance, that Moses III in Semna, or Kuma is it, I think it's Semna, that bird was extinct in New Kingdom Egypt. So the scene was probably inherited as a ritual scene from somewhere else, possibly copied from an old or middle kingdom uh, predecessor. So that's uh, possibly another reason to speculate about where graffiti stand in uh, the landscapes of memory of uh, ancient Egyptians. So they're probably very purposefully left written message within a monument that had a particular meaning for the visitors, and they're actually helping, they're set in uh, realms of memory, but they're actually helping to create new realms of memory of or for the sovereigns of 18th dynasty. Uh, however, not to disregard the other, or many, it's not just one, aspects of uh, landscapes in Memphis. Now, to borrow from Thebes, uh, you know, you're familiar with uh, the Theban uh, sacred landscape or landscapes in Prolo, where processional routes, as Helen mentioned, were but one aspect of it, but they probably operated there. And Thebes provide a nice uh, model, even though we're not as well informed about the Memphite operations, but uh, Ptah Sokar Osiris, or Sokar, certainly had feasts and also processional feasts in Memphis. And it's quite possible that some of these moved in the western suburbs of Memphis or actually ventured in sanctuaries that were set close by or in the necropolis. So people actually had another reason to go there and to stop by. And also, Sahmet of Sahura was already uh, mentioned. So um, Sahmet of Sahura actually invites a very interesting moment, I think. There is a Ramesside graffito that's not located in Sahura, or was, you can't see it now, it was, I'm afraid, uh, fortunately copied by Czerny, but since then lost. It's a Ramesside graffito in Master of Plakshepses, and it mentions people coming to that area, and they, they're mentioned, we're standing in front of you, Sahmet, 
in revelry or in you were standing in front of you drunken. Now, is it a coincidence or does it refer to the hetoric element of, well, festivals of drunkenness that are so frequently connected with mood, vulgo, hato, vulgo, sachmat? So that brings quite interesting notions to our um, ideas about what a graffiti maker's day um, might have been uh, like. Namely, are we looking at scholars operating in the realm of memory or artisans studying uh, new models, scenes, texts to apply in their own contemporary context? Actually, there, there is uh, this, this question, is it scholars, scribes, literati, or is it artists, craftsmen, artisans? How many sehau or sesho are demonstrating their literacy and how many of them are abbreviating the title draftsman, Sehau Kedo. That's again a moot point because we know the graffiti which explicitly say there came a Seha Kedo and then we know a plethora of graffiti that mention just a Seha, just the scribe. And then on the top of that we know graffiti that seem to mention Hemu, the craftsman. And then to complicate the matters, to, to create a real mess, there are graffiti of people who sign off with their title, such as the royal steward, actually, Amunet Jech of Tutmosis III, who came to see uh, Abu Sir at the Sun Temple of Usarkaf, and he signs off with his official title, or somebody signed for him. That's, uh, that's uh, another point in collection of mood points. So that's one part of it. And then finally, festival days, a merry party, even with hetoric overtones. And since this is a really uh, late hour, um, I'm somehow reminded of uh, various uh, graffiti in Asiu that Ursula Verhoeven mentioned, where actually the visitors are commenting on the intimate lives of their fellow visitors. Uh, well, it's hard to imagine that, but. Could this be in any connection with hetoric elements in a festival of drunkenness? Well, hard to say. In any case, there are the options, and to make a real accurate mess, of course, these could have overlapped, creating a very uh, specific setting, but I think m maybe truer to the graffiti situation in the Memphite landscape than any attempt to divide into really, really uh, strict categories. Um, but since graffiti by definition are characterized by diversity, diversity in time and in space, take the Memphite example as one large, completely not uniform demonstration of literacy in the landscape, but also a demonstration of many other features within the Egyptian culture. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>